Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I am here today to wrap up the reading month of March and talk about the things I've read and my plans for April a little bit. It's a little hard to believe that we've reached the end of March. This year seems to be flying along at a fairly rapid clip and that's always a bit surprising and disconcerting when you realize that you're this far into a year that felt new like a day ago. But that's neither here nor there. March was a really interesting reading month because as I started thinking about doing a reading wrap-up video for the month, I thought to myself, it would be a really boring video because I didn't really read anything in the month of March. And then I double-checked, and sure enough, I actually finished four books, and I just DNF'd a fifth. So there actually is a lot to talk about, and yet I had pretty much forgotten most of the books that I read this month. And that probably tells you something about the quality, in my opinion, of the books that I read or how much they are sitting with me, rather. Because I didn't necessarily read bad books. They just didn't quite sit the way something that, say, I read in February or January would have. But let's talk about them. And then we'll talk about my tentative reading plans for April I'm not really making hard plans for the month of April, but I do have some ideas that I would like to get to. So let's talk about that. The first book that I finished in the month of March was Book Boyfriend by Chris Ripper. This was something that I was reading. Uh, it, it was an advanced copy that I was reading on NetGalley. And it is a queer romance. It follows a man named, I believe, Art no, Art is the friend. I always forget the name of the main character in the book. And that probably, again, ties into how the books that I've read in March just don't quite sit with me. Like, they're not living in my heart or anything like that. So the protagonist has been in love with his roommate from college, who is his best friend, for years. They did share a kiss in college when they were drinking. And then, for various reasons, it didn't go any further than a kiss. And then the next day, the friend, whose name is Art was making jokes about, oh, can you believe we kissed? And they never attempted it again. Now, Art had a boyfriend for a while. That relationship blew up. Art shows up at the protagonist's apartment needing a place to stay. So they end up roommates again. And the protagonist is sort of hoping that Art will begin to see him as a romantic figure, but it's just not happening. And he works in publishing. And he starts channeling all of that into a book about someone who is in love with his best friend who does not see him as a romantic figure. And he feels like he can't tell Art about the book and then romantic comedy mishaps ensue from there. It's a cute enough book. It sounds like it should be something that would be right up my alley because I do like romantic comedies and I especially like LGBTQ romances. But I didn't quite enjoy it because the protagonist is a mess. There's probably a reason I just can't remember his name. He's trying too hard to be funny. He is disorganized, messy, self-absorbed. I feel like if I had listened to an audio version of this that was narrated by Michael Yuri, I would have forgiven it a lot more. But the fact that I just didn't like him very much made it a very difficult book to get through. And that is probably ultimately why I don't really remember this book all that well. And by the end of the year, I probably won't remember it much at all. I did like that art over the course of the book doesn't quite come out as non-binary, but starts to use they, them pronouns. And I'd always appreciate when a character kind of steps up and shows themselves to be better than what you had thought that they were. And the protagonist does have a moment of that at the end. But ultimately, I wanted to like it more than I actually did. The premise of it sounds cute. Your mileage may vary. I just found myself getting irritated by the protagonist of the book and a lot of the things that he did. He really can't get out of his own way a lot. And the setup that leads to the resolution feels forced because, of course, this that whole idea that he feels like he can't tell Art that he has written this book that is coming out and then in a romance, there's always something that causes them to separate before they come together for a happy ending, most of the time. And I didn't really believe the thing that makes them separate in this book. And I won't spend a whole lot of time on that, but that was the first book that I read in the month of March. The next one I finished was Where the Deer and the Antelope Play, 
The Pastoral Observations of One Ignorant American Who Loves to Walk Outside by Nick Offerman. There's been an interesting development in March. In January and February, I was not having much luck at all with audiobooks, and I was doing a lot more time reading print books, which is a reversal from the last few years where I've been doing a lot more reading on audio and have sort of struggled to keep up in print. I had never read a Nick Offerman book, but I am, of course, familiar with him. I like him. I like his wife, Megan Mullally, and I think he's sort of a charming guy. So I listened to this on audio. I actually had been on hold since November of last year for the audio on Libby. And I had a feeling that it would be a book that could sort of bring me back to audio. And it did. It worked really well in that regard. The book is very good. It's very charming. I don't know that it's going to stay with me. By the end of the year, I probably won't remember a lot of the details. But it was certainly an enjoyable ride while I was listening to it. The first part of the book, in fact, is in Glacier National Park. Nick Offerman goes to hike there with George Saunders. Yes, the George Saunders who wrote Lincoln in the Bardo, 10th of, 10th of December, and things like that. And Jeff Tweedy from the band Wilco. That was fun because that is sort of in my backyard. And, and then it goes into the pandemic a little bit. And it, it deals with a lot of current events and the ways in which current events can be very frustrating. But it does it in a way that doesn't really, it doesn't go in hard on those. And it doesn't get scientific. It doesn't get political all that much. So it feels clarifying about a lot of things and not necessarily challenging or stressful. And I really deeply appreciated that as well. So I would recommend it. I don't know if it's a great book, but I certainly enjoyed it. And it got me back on the audiobook wagon, which was very nice. The next thing that I finished in the month of March was actually two short stories together by Yuko Tsushima of Dogs and Walls. And the other story is called The Watery Realm. This was sent to me by Sean the Book Maniac last year, and I just got around to reading both of them now. I liked them fine, but, you know, I don't actually remember all that much about the stories, and that's kind of a common theme. I don't think they're going to factor into my favorites at the end of the year. They were great while I was reading them, and then I put them down and moved on, if that makes sense. These are well-written. They deal with a sort of blurring of the line between the real world and a sort of dream world, almost Haruki Murakami-esque, if you've read Murakami. The Watery Realm is the one that I remember more of, and it has a lot of interesting allusions to suicide. It's using the watery realm as a sort of place that someone might go afterward. And that was really interesting. And I believe ties back to Yuko Tsushima's own life. So I can recommend this, but again, it's not going to factor into my best of the year. It was just something that I enjoyed while I was reading it. And then I kind of moved on to something else. The one book that I think will probably be factoring in to my conversation about best things I've read this year was Don't Cry For Me by Daniel Black, which I also listened to on audio, even though I actually have a copy of the book. And I thought this was just fantastic. I'll put a link to my most recent Friday Reads video in the description box down below because I talked at length about this book. I loved it a lot. If you're unfamiliar, it is a novel in letters but each chapter is an individual letter, so it's not like one long letter. It is set or written uh, in 2003 and 2004. A father named Jacob is dying of cancer, and he starts writing letters to his estranged son. A large part of the estrangement has to do with the fact that the son is gay, and he is telling his family story. It's a lot to do with generational trauma and different toxic masculinity and expectations of gender roles and poverty and a little bit of systemic racism in the United States and what expectations were put on him. He's not really necessarily asking for forgiveness. He is hoping for understanding. And that is one of the really great things about this book. Daniel Black isn't really asking you to let the father off the hook for the things that he did in his life. He's more asking you to understand and say, so you can say, he did a lot of terrible things. I see why, but he did a lot of terrible things. And that is a really interesting dynamic for the book. You see pretty much everything through the lens of the father because he is the one writing the letters. I would be fascinated to have Daniel Black write another book after this 
from the perspective of the sun. I don't know if that would ever happen. I don't know if it would work, but I would be really fascinated to see how that works because the sun is this peripheral figure who is in integral to the way the book works. And I really enjoyed this a lot. Again, I talked about it at great length in a recent Friday Reads video, and I'll link that in, in the description box down below. I will say that Erica from The Broken Spine and my husband, Joel, are going to be doing an interview with Daniel Black in April. I'll put a link to her channel in the description box down below as well, so you can check that out. I don't want to promise <laughs> when it will be posted because I don't want to hold Erica to a specific date. But if you subscribe to her channel, you'll see it when it becomes available. I am really looking forward to seeing what their conversation with Daniel Black looks like because I think there's a lot to say about this book and Daniel Black is a great author with a lot of perspective. He reads the audiobook and he does a really great job of that. Moving along from there, I had been listening to the audio of The Sentence by Louise Erdrich and I love Louise Erdrich's voice. She's a great narrator for her own work. Ultimately, I didn't finish it. I realized I was coming up toward the end. I was about two hours away from finishing the book, and my hold, I was listening to this on Libby, was about to end. And the thing with Libby, you can't renew your hold. All you can do is get back on the wait list, and the wait list is another 24 weeks. So I did get back on the wait list, but I just let it go. I didn't try to push myself to finish it before the hold expired. And I don't know, maybe 24 weeks from now when the book becomes available again, I might finish it. I don't think so. So I think it's probably safe to say that this is going to be a DNF, which is a bit of a shame. It just feels like the two biggest things people talk about when they talk about this book are kind of small in the actual book. The first part is that the premise of the book is that Tukey, who works in a bookstore owned by Louise Erdrich in Minneapolis, and Louise Erdrich, by the way, does own a bookstore in Minneapolis called Birchbark. It's a great store. Starts getting haunted by the ghost of what is described as their most annoying customer, Flora, who dies on All Souls Day, and the book takes place over the next year. That She dies on All Souls Day 2019. The book goes through 2020. So the pandemic begins in the book, and that's the other thing people tend to talk about. But the ghost story doesn't really feel like it manifests, and I'm not trying to make a pun when I say that, but it doesn't feel like it comes to anything. Maybe it does in the very end. I feel like it's building to something, but... The other thing is, Flora is described as the most annoying customer, but when Tuki talks about her and the other people talk about her, she doesn't actually feel that annoying. Like, there are so many things she could have done that would have made her more annoying. In fact, there's another customer who gets nicknamed Dissatisfaction because he's never happy, and yet he feels much more like he would potentially be an annoying customer. However, Tuki likes the challenge of trying to recommend a book that he will like. So... It's an interesting dynamic, and I actually knew a customer sort of like dissatisfaction when I worked at Borders back in the day, who everybody in the store hated because he was so difficult. And I actually grew to have an almost friendly relationship with him because he was an unfriendly person, but if he felt that you knew what you were doing and could talk to him, he would actually be really nice to you. And part of the thing that everybody didn't like about him was that he was one of the only people who ever came to our store to make purchases for a tax-exempt organization. And the register at Borders made it really difficult to process that transaction. And because we didn't really do them, a lot of employees didn't know how to do them. Anyway, point being, I knew how to do that transaction, so he would always look for me. And I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying, like, it's interesting to have this dynamic between the customers. And yet somehow Flora is labeled as the most annoying one, but I don't feel like it fits and then the pandemic part doesn't feel urgent or like she's making any kind of point about the pandemic. I don't get anything from reading about the pandemic that I couldn't have gotten from watching the news or talking to anyone else who has survived the last three years in the world. And it's interesting on the one hand because it feels like it relates to things that are still ongoing because we are still in the pandemic. But... It doesn't have any sense of poignancy to it. It just feels like, okay, yes, we know. And it also felt weird because in the beginning of the pandemic, the characters 
are talking and saying things like, oh, we don't even know how this spreads. But, you know, I've been alive for the last three years and I could say we did know how COVID-19 spread when it began. So that felt a little bit odd. And ultimately, the story just felt unfocused. And maybe it comes together in the end, but I also don't feel invested in the story enough to really care. And that sounds really harsh, but it kind of is what it is. It was an entirely pleasant listen. I just didn't feel like I had any need to rush to the ending. And now that I'm back on a 24-week hold list, I don't feel any sense of urgency to actually finish. And if I end up letting it go, I'll be fine with that. Which is why I am classifying this as my first DNF of the year. And that's kind of unfortunate because I do like Louise Erdrich. I love The Plague of Doves. I loved Love Medicine. And I definitely want to read more of her work in the future. But the sentence looks like it's my first DNF of the year. I'm glad I made it to March without having a DNF. That's a pretty good run. Now let's talk about what I have... Coming up in the month of April, again, some kind of loose plans for what I'm going to be reading because I'm trying not to give myself a whole lot. Now, in March, I did not get to to The Friend Who Did Not Save My Life by Hervé Gourbert. This was the second book for the LGBTQ in translation read-along for February and March. I am going to hold on to it on my night table, hoping that I will get to it in April and May. But I will say I'm going to start with the selection for the LGBTQ in translation read along for April and May 1st because I have more urgency to get this done than I do to catch up on that one. So Before Night Falls by Ronaldo Arenas translated by Dolores M. Koch is one of the first books that I will try to get to in April. I am also probably going to push Disoriental by Negar Javadi translated by Tina Cover to May because that is the other selection for the April-May LGBTQ in translation read-along. So I'll probably hold off on both of these. Uh, Disoriental will probably be May. If I have time, I'll do To the Friend Who Did Not Save My Life, but Before Night Falls is going to be prioritized for April for me. I also got Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois by Honoré Fernand Jeffers from the library. It's going to be due back soon, and I haven't even started it, and it's a brick of a book. So I need to finish the book that I'm currently reading on audio, and or not on audio. I'm currently reading an e-galley of a book, which I'll talk about in a second. I didn't include it in my March wrap-up because it's carrying into April. So I need to finish that, and then I'll probably jump on Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. And then I have another e-galley uh, by Jennifer Egan, The Candy House, that I really want to get to, which is the book is actually releasing in April. So I feel like I need to get to it now. So I'm probably going to finish... Violets by Kyung Suk Shin, translated by Anton Hur, which is the e-galley that I'm currently reading. Then I'll probably get to this because it's a library book. Then I want to do The Candy House by Jennifer Egan, and then I'll pick up Before Night Falls. That's like really weird, confusing presentation. Hopefully it all makes sense to you, but that's the reading plan. And I don't want to put too much else on my pile because I have been so slow getting through print books that I don't want to pressure myself to do more than the four books that I've talked about. So I'm going to finish Violets, then hopefully I'll do Love Songs, then hopefully The Candy House, and then Before Night Falls. That's what I'm aiming for in terms of print. I have no real plan for audio, although I did just get access to Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead, so I'm probably going to be listening to that one next. I'll be starting that one today, so that's my audio plan for April. And that is what March has been in terms of reading. That's a kind of look ahead to what April will look like. I'd love to hear how your reading was in March. I'd love to hear what you have planned for April. Okay, also, April is Aussie April. That just occurred to me. And I have Inland Sea by Madeline Watts, which was something that I wanted to read last year and didn't get around to. So I'm going to put that on my pile of possibilities for the month of April. Maybe I'll do that before, before night falls if timing works out just to make things even more complicated. So do you have anything planned for Aussie April? April is also National Poetry Month. So let me know what you have planned for the month in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.